Welcome to Populism and Politics, a new online course from Johns Hopkins University. I'm Yasha Munk. I'm an associate professor of the practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University, as well as a senior fellow at the SNF Agora Institute. Now, I'm also the author of The People vs. Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It. That was one of the first books after 2016 to look at the rise of authoritarian populists like Donald Trump in the United States, like Narendra Modi in India, like Viktor Orban in Hungary, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and examine the threat that they posed to liberal democracy. And that is also the topic about which I would like to speak together in this course. I first became interested in questions around democracy in graduate school. And what I learned at the time was that it was very hard to build stable democracies. That there are many countries in the world where democracy doesn't have a long history or tradition. Countries which are relatively poor, in which we have to worry about the future stability of that political system. So, if somebody had told me 10 or 12 years ago that today Thailand would no longer be a real democracy, but democracy would at best be struggling in a country like Tanzania, I would have been very sad to hear it, but I would not have been entirely surprised. At the same time, I also learned a much more hopeful, a much more optimistic fact. In countries which had had at least two changes of government for free and fair elections, in countries that had a GDP per capita of at least $14,000 per year, I was told, we really didn't have to worry about democracy. Those countries had been consolidated. We could fast forward history by 10 or 30 or 50 years, and unless something truly extraordinary happened, we would know that those countries would still be democracies. One reason for that was that they were supposed to have a very stable political culture. But when you looked at those countries, democracy had become, in the phrase of one famous sentence in the literature, the only game in town. When you looked at politicians who held any real powers in those places, they were supposed to support, to accept the core institutions and values of our political system. Well, I started to worry about whether this was really true before the 2016 elections, which changed so much in the world. I saw that people were more and more dissatisfied with democracy, that they gave less importance to living in a democracy than they used to, that they even in some places were more open to authoritarian alternatives. But it is the political events of the last four or five years that have really put pressure on those forms of received wisdom. Around the world, we have seen the rise of populist governments and populist leaders from Donald Trump in the United States to Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil to Narendra Modi in India to Viktor Orban in Hungary to Recep Erdogan in Turkey to Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and many more beyond that. They do not accept the legitimacy of many of the institutions in their countries and they have fundamentally challenged many of the values around which we appeared to have a consensus. Now, I hear some of you say, what do these people have in common? Isn't the term populism just something that's thrown around against people we happen to dislike, against people who don't fit into some kind of moderate or centrist policy lane, against people who are honestly concerned about some of the real problems we have in the world and are saying, we need some new solutions. Now, I'll admit something to you. I also find the way in which the term populism is often used to be confused, misleading, partisan. When I open the New York Times, at least 50% of the mentions that I see of the word populism seem to me as a political scientist to be inappropriate. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a coherent core to the idea of populism. It is that coherent core that I want to explain to you in the mini-lecture today. Populists, as I've already acknowledged, are very different from each other. They don't necessarily have the same set of economic policies, and many of them are quite 
right wing on the economy, but some of them, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, are very left wing. They don't always have the same enemies. When you look at somebody like Donald Trump in the United States, he does not appear to be, to put it mildly, overly fond of Muslims. But when you look at somebody like Recep Erdogan in Turkey, he does not appear to be overly fond of anybody who's not a Muslim. So they don't have that in common either. What they do share is a common narrative, a common imagination of our politics. What we do share is a way of thinking about the world which is relatively straightforward. The only real reason why we have political problems today, we tend to say, is that there's a political elite that is corrupt and self-serving that cares more about various outsiders than they do about real people, quote-unquote, like you and me. And therefore, what we need to do to fix those problems is quite simple. Somebody who truly stands for the people, who truly represents the American or the Turkish or the Hungarian or the Venezuelan people, needs to be elected, do away with those corrupt elites, do away with anybody who stands in the way of the will of the people, and that'll solve everything. Now, there's two elements to this that I would like to call attention to. The first is a form of anti-elitism, of saying there's something wrong with the current government, there's something wrong with the people who really make important decisions in our country, and it's time for a change. That is a normal part of democratic politics. From George W. Bush to Barack Obama, virtually every successful presidential candidate in the United States has, in the, has engaged in some form of anti-elitism as well. So far, anti-elitism is one of the hallmarks of populism. It is not a sufficient condition of who is a populist. That fact alone does not make somebody a populist, and it's not the most problematic aspect of populism either. Rather, somebody becomes a populist because of that second element, the anti-pluralist element, the element that says, I and I alone represent the people. And if you disagree with me, you're not just wrong about something important. I'm not just going to try to convince you. You are fundamentally illegitimate. You are a traitor. You are an enemy of the people. And it is that second part of the definition of populism, that anti-pluralist element, that really helps to explain why populism is a threat to the two core values of our political system. Two core values to our political system. What do I mean by that? Well, political scientists like to say that we live in a liberal democracy. Liberal in this context is not a partisan term. It's not liberal and conservative, left and right. Another term for it, if you prefer it, is a democratic republic. It tries to get at the same idea that there's two fundamental values to our political system. One of them is the idea of collective self-determination. That we don't let our political decisions be made by a king or an army general or a priest or an imam or a dictator, we make them ourselves, collectively. We together decide what laws we should be bound by. That is the literal promise of democracy, rule by the people. Now, the second element of this is not the democratic element, it's the liberal element. It's the idea of individual rights and individual freedoms. We don't just want the majority to decide whatever they want and they can tell you what color shirt to wear and what you're allowed to say. We also want to ensure that people in our societies have a realm of freedom in which they're unimpeded by the government and by others. I should be allowed to determine myself what to say or not say, which god to worship and whether to worship a god at all, whom to have over for dinner tonight and whom to ask to stay after dinner if I and they so wish. Now, in order to protect those individual freedoms, we don't just need a Bill of Rights, we also need the rule of law and a set of independent institutions. Because if a president or a prime minister can come in and say, I don't like what that guy just said, I'm going to throw him in jail, then any Bill of Rights is not worth the parchment it was written on. Populists are a danger to both of those values. They are most immediately a danger to individual rights. They tend to scapegoat and attack 
unpopular minorities, so they threaten their rights. But they also set themselves up against the rule of law and independent institutions. Because they say that they and they alone truly represent the people, they do not recognize that it is legitimate for there to be independent institutions. When the media criticize them, they deride them as the enemies of the people. When a judge says, hey, that executive order is not something you are constitutionally allowed to do, they say, who is that judge? I am the representative of the people. Uh, that person is just an imposter. We should be ignoring them. And when law enforcement agencies start to investigate a friend or a political ally of a president or prime minister, they say that shouldn't be allowed to happen. They are going against the elected representative of the people. They should be doing what I, the representative of the people, is telling them to do. Now, that means that populism is in the first instance a threat to the liberal element of our political system, that it attacks and undermines the individual freedoms that I hope is, are important to all of us. But in the long run, populism doesn't just establish an illiberal democracy, it actually tends towards an illiberal dictatorship. Because once the government controls the media, is able to curtail the rights of the opposition, has placed its loyalists in the electoral commission, the second core value of our political system starts to be under threat as well. Suddenly, it is no longer possible to remove a democratically elected government by democratic means. This is the case we have now unambiguously reached in a country that is not very large, but very important in this context, Hungary. Hungary fulfills those conditions of democratic consolidation that I was taught about in graduate school. It has changed governments for free and fair elections about five times since 1990. It has a GDP per capita of over $14,000 a year. It's supposed to be a safe democracy. And yet Viktor Orban, who was democratically elected in 1990, has, since he has come to power, assembled so much influence in his own hands, undermined independent institutions to such an extent, taking such a control over the media there, that independent observers said the last election was mostly free, but no longer fair. Now, in the context of COVID-19, he has suspended parliament indefinitely, taken on the power to rule by decree, and told people that they can be jailed for spreading, quote-unquote, false rumors on social media. Hungary is now a dictatorship. It is one of the most important cases in which we see how the populist attack on the two core values of our political system, individual freedom and collective self-determination, threatens to move many countries from democracy to dictatorship. So today we're very privileged to have Daniel Ziblatt join us. Uh, Daniel is the Eaton Professor of Government at Harvard University, and the author, uh, among many important books, the co-author of How Democracies Die. Um, the word populism is very confusing, uh, Dan. A lot of people use it in a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes it's just used as a kind of uh, a political uh, ram in order to tarnish your opponents. Um, what do you think the term means? Does it, does it have any real use? Well, it certainly is one of these terms. It's a kind of an essentially contested concept, I would say. A lot of people have different meanings attached to it. The, obviously, the historical context of it is uh, the Populist Party in the United States in the late 19th century, which had a very particular historical uh, meaning. Um, and, you know, that's important to recognize that. But I think in current political debates, it has a, a different meaning than that historical meaning. Um, connected, but different. And so I, I think the term today describes a particular kind of political claim or political style that certain types of politicians use. Um, so it's not as much an ideology as much as a kind of orientation towards politics. 
And that particular kind of orientation is somebody who claims to speak on behalf of the people in an exclusive way. So in other words, they uh, are the true representatives of the people. Um, what's dangerous about that is certainly that if you claim to be the only spokesperson for the people, however you define it, then anybody who disagrees with you is in some way not legitimate. And so in this sense, although being a populist sounds like it could be democratic, in, in a lot of ways, it often is anti-democratic. So the problem with populism on your account is not that it often criticizes the elite fiercely or that it has a particular set of policy positions. It's really about this refusal to accept different participants of a democratic system uh, as legitimate. Um, yeah, I think that's right. You know, so I, th I think, you know, being democratic is often, often can also be anti-elite. I mean, that's, that's true that that's a big part of the kind of rhetorical uh, uh, trope of a, of a populist is to be anti-elite, anti-business elite, anti-political elite. Anti uh, but but that's all in the service of claiming that the particular politician is is the true spokesperson for the elite, uh, or I'm sorry, for the people. Um, so that that's that's what makes it dangerous. Um, the particular ideological content, I think, turns out not to be that important. I mean, there's left wing populism that as people talk about, and right wing populism, um, and the, the ideology of being you know is often not particularly problematic. It's, it's the particular style of politics and the kind of claim of legitimacy that the political leader makes that's, that's, what, that's worth noting. So in uh, How Democracies Die, I suppose you get at this set of ideas for the idea of uh, mutual toleration, for the concept of mutual toleration. Um, so what is mutual toleration? Why is that uh, so important? And what happens to a political system when it runs out? Yeah, so the, the idea of toleration is an interesting one, and mutual toleration in particular is an interesting one, because essentially what it is, the, the, the underlying idea is that you often will disagree with people. You'll even find people's ideas uh, offensive, but at the heart of democracy, our claim is essentially publicly accepting that the other side has a, a right to represent their views, has a right to run for office, and if, has a right if they beat us to win. Um, and somebody who, somebody who it, it, that's a hard belief to hold on to. And it, it was an idea that had to be invented because, you know, if you think you are right, why should you let another side win? But it, at the heart of democracy, I think is in many ways, um, the idea that nobody has a monopoly on truth, uh, that you may be wrong, a kind of certain level of uncertainty and modesty and to recognize that somebody else may may be right. And so you have to be willing to, to entertain opposing ideas. That doesn't mean you don't fight hard for your beliefs. That doesn't mean you don't try to win. But, uh, but the, the way I think this connects to populism is a populist kind of in, in my view would be one who thinks they have a monopoly on the truth because they have this ultimate claim to legitimacy, which is representing the people. And so if a politician claims that they are the only true spokesman for the people, then it's much harder to maintain an orientation of mutual toleration, which is really a kind of unwritten part of our political systems, but is really critical for any democracy. And one of the things that happens when people don't have mutual toleration, and in particular when one set of political actors, perhaps populists, um, believe that the opponents are so bad, so dangerous, so illegitimate, that they don't owe them the basic uh, sort of set of considerations, is what you call constitutional hardball. So what does constitutional hardball uh, look like and, and why should we worry about it? Yeah, so, so there really, there's sort of two underpinnings of democracy, unwritten parts of democracy, um, I, in, in my view. One is this notion of mutual toleration and the other is a kind of notion of self-restraint. That if you, if you don't have a monopoly on the truth, then although you fight hard for your beliefs, again, you, you don't push to the max. You know, if you have a certain institutional prerogative or power, you don't always use it to the max. Um, and so, you know, for just to take an example from, in, from American history, you know, no, in, until after Roosevelt, there was no limit on term limits for presidents. You know, so in other words, people could, if, in principle, a president, if running for office, could keep running for office and be president for life. But no president ever ran for a third term after uh, Washington established this unwritten rule of self-restraint. So what hardball is, is the idea that you do push to the max. 
Um, and you know, if the if it's if the rule is there, you use it full, you leverage it fully to the maximum. And so, if there's a, a rule allowing you to be president for life, you are president. You try to be president for life if you can get away with it. And how this connects to, to mutual toleration is that if one thinks doesn't give the other side kind of the legitimacy of having a legitimate kind of view point of view then of course you're gonna to push to the max. Or put, to put it the other way, if you think the other side is an existential threat in some way, then of course you're gonna use any means necessary to stop your, the other side from gaining power. So you'll, you'll once in power, push to the max. And even if you're out of power, do everything possible to dislodge the other side from power. And so I, again, I think both of these, the, the norm of mutual toleration and this norm of self-restraint are antithetical to populists. And populists, because they have this ultimate claim to legitimacy in a democratic world, I mean, that's an important precondition, I think, is that you, you know, in, a, in a world in which the people are the ultimate source of legitimacy in the democratic world in which we live, that's where populism comes from, because they can make this claim. Uh, and again, it's critical that they have the exclusive claim to this, because all politicians, to, to some degree, you know, say they are aligned with the people, they're doing what the people want, but they don't, you know, a, a, a democratic politician is not one who uh, says that they have some special insight that nobody else uh, has into the people. It's this idea that I and I alone truly represent yes. the people. And we see exactly. uh, important instantiations of uh, democratic politicians um, enforcing that line, that they don't have that exclusive claim to representation uh, in actual politics from time to time. I always think of a moment in the run-up to the 2008 election in which John McCain was doing a town hall and one of the members of the audience said, you know, I'm really scared of Barack Obama. If he becomes president, it's going to be terrible for our country. And John McCain, to his lasting honor, responded by saying, look, I think I represent the people better than Barack Obama. I think I would have better policies than Barack Obama. I think it's really important that he vote for me. But you don't have to be scared of Barack Obama because he's a legitimate politician. He is. Uh, and I would just, I would just add to that. What's, what's so poisonous in a way about populism defined in these terms is that it's contagious in a way. Um, so if, if a politician is claiming that they and they alone represent the people, they don't grant the other side to mutual toleration. They push to the max. If you're a democratic politician who subscribe to kind of pluralist worldview in which there's competing views, and you're faced with this kind of leader, there's incredible temptation to respond uh, with your own hardball and to say, well, these guy, this guy is not legitimate. He's claiming to be the exclusive spokesman for the, for the people. He's not. And so the only way to beat this person is to fight fire with fire. And so th this is the kind of death spiral of, of why populists infect democratic systems in a way that, that ends up leading to kind of a decay or spiral, this kind of spiraling of, of hardball. So there's a kind of surprising element of your concept of constitutional hardball, which is to say that I understand why people who are not willing to play by the rules are a danger to democracy. If you are elected democratically, um, but then once you're in office, you say, I build up my little power troops of goons, and whenever anybody comes out to protest me, I'm going to shoot in the crowd. That's obviously a danger to democracy. What's interesting about constitutional hardball is that it doesn't uh, seem to assume rule breaking. It seems to assume that you can operate within the formal rules, and yet you're actually out of bounds. How should we think about that? Yeah, no, that's right. And that's, it's, it is, it's especially the case in systems in which you have short constitutions, like the American system, or no constitution, like the British system. And so not every rule is written down. Um, and so what happens is if, if people file, follow the rule to the T in a way, you can get an escalation. And just to give you an example, I gave you the example of, of, the, of presidents being presidents for life, following the law. Um, similarly, you know, there's no law about the size of this in the Constitution. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution about the size of the Supreme Court. So in principle, if a president doesn't like how, if he has a friendly Senate, if he doesn't like how the uh, court is ruling, just expand the size of the Supreme Court. It's perfectly legal. Uh, the, the Senate can hold up every president's nomination uh, for, for a cabinet position. Again, there's nothing prohibiting them from doing this. So, you know, you could say, well, it's legal, but if everybody pushes to the max, the system becomes in incredibly dysfunctional. And so that's, that's why then it becomes, so it's both a threat to the kind of functionality of democracy 
And it also escalates the level of tensions within a political system. And so in that sense, I think it's, it's very dangerous. And, and you know, we often, you often hear today that, you know, the way democracies die today is not, you know, um, through military coups, but through constitutional and parliamentary rulings. And this is how this happens, is that politicians follow the letter of the law in a way that actually undermines the spirit of the law. So your very influential book was called uh, How Democracies Die. Um, have democracies died because of a lack of mutual toleration and of constitutional hardball in the last few years? Is there empirical evidence where we really need to be worried about the impact that uh, the rise of these populists has had on democracies around the world? Yes, I think so. Uh, but there's been democracies that have had that really have fully died. I would say I would I would put Hungary in that camp. Um, and Hungary is clearly a case where Viktor Orban, as, as prime minister, has through very legal means used these strategies of constitutional hardball or abandoned self-restraint. So, you know, for example, expanding the for enforcing retirement ages, you know, passing a law that enforces a retirement age on the courts, which will then allow him to kind of pack the courts with his allies, redrawing of electoral districts to maximize his party's uh, uh, position of power and, and to create super majorities. And so using legal means, pushing to the max, slowly and incrementally democracy kind of withers away. So that, that's an extreme case. I think there's also cases where democracy hasn't died, but it's certainly at risk. And I would say the United States is a case like this. I think American democracy is still alive, but it's been put at a, a level of risk that we have not experienced in our lifetimes. And a lot of that has come about through efforts at constitutional hardball, I would say. I mean, so the firing of you know, so the essentially abandoning of unwritten rules and the and the kind of intervention of the president in domains where it's clearly he's acting in his self interest to fire uh, inspector generals to fire the FBI director. Uh, this is undermining the basic restraints that our system has relied upon. And again, all of this has always been legal, for the you know I, I think, but for the most part, um, and yet this has put our democracy at risk. And so one of the you know, things is what's striking is that, you know, what's legal can actually destroy a democracy. And I think, and, and at least weaken a democracy. We've seen this in the United States, certainly as well. Daniel Ziblatt, thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Yasha.